Muslims are now forbidden to build minarets on their mosques. Islamophobia is growing in Europe and the United States. Anti-Semitism is also increasing in Europe, especially against <coughs> Orthodox Jews who are visible in their costumes. As we know, the veil is deeply polarizing, a locus for the struggle between Islam and the West and between contemporary and traditional interpretations of Islam. But veiling of women, men, and sacred places and objects has existed among people of countless spiritual practices from time immemorial. From the beginning of human time, in nearly every era and place, the veil in one form or another has played a part in sacred activities and thought. Yet the veil is obviously vastly misunderstood and exploited on all sides. As the scholar Ivan Haddad points out, the issue of hijab, which is covering, has risen to such heights as to be called sarcastically the sixth pillar of Islam, along with prayer, fasting, almsgiving, pilgrimage, and witnessing to Muhammad as the seal of the Prophet and the oneness of God. Once upon a time, the veil in all its multiplicity was more or less taken for granted everywhere as, at the very least, an essential expression of the divine mysteries. Veiling might have started when humans watched eclipses and observed the periodic shedding of animals' outer bodily layer, like feathers, skin, fur, horn, or cocoons. A child born with a caul, which is a membrane over the face, is said to be veiled and sometimes thought to have second sight, as well as extraordinary good luck. Indeed, veiling is often related to prophecy. The Greek oracle of Delphi was masked and veiled behind vapors of underground gases. Veiling and veils are found in the oldest myths, in folklore, in fairy tale, and in all the arts. The veil itself is mystery, even as it's the shroud that guards the mystery, and as much as the veil is fabric or garment, it is also a concept. It is illusion, vanity, artifice, deception. Oops, let's move on here. Ah. Deception, liberation, imprisonment, theater, euphemism, divination, concealment, secrecy, depression, eloquent silence, holiness, the ethers behind con beyond consciousness, the hidden hundredth name of God, the final passage into death, even the biblical apocalypse, the lifting of God's veil to signal the end times. When veiling is forced, then enforced, it is repression. But as we have seen increasingly today, the veil is also a symbol of resistance against ethnic and religious discrimination. When the veil is forcibly stripped from its wearer, that too is subjugation, not emancipation. In Algeria, as Franz Fanon reminds us in A Dying Colonial, <coughs> the French waged war against veiling for decades, even denying bread to women unless they removed their veils. Might the continuing French war against the veil be, as Joan Wallen Scott asks in The Politics of the Veil, a symptom of France's inability or unwillingness to face racism? that has characterized its dealings with North Africans for so long. Today's expressions of fear of the other have a frighteningly familiar <coughs> echo. I would add that it's only been 67 years since the liberation of Auschwitz and the end of the Vichy, and less than a year and a half since the massacre in Norway by a right-wing extremist who is not without sympathizers and allies. I grew up in heavily Catholic, and later in Muslim environments, where veiling was common. In those days, as Egyptian feminist Huda Sharawi also observed on her travels in a much earlier decade, a rural Italian or Greek woman looked not so different from, say, a rural Egyptian woman. Were these acts of piety, political statements, fashion statements? How and why have we politicized customs so ancient their origins and meanings cannot necessarily be traced and certainly can't be blamed on any group or event. And when I say we, I do indeed mean all of us, East and West. We all collude in turning women's bodies into battlegrounds, nowadays signified by the Muslim veil. I started this work in about 2000, and my hope has been to um, at least contextualize the veil. 
So this presentation is a brief and somewhat fragmented catalog of contextualizations. The whens and whys of failing are, of course, mostly speculation and certainly subject to argument, as are the whethers. Throughout history, the veil has signified rank, religion, and marital status, or indicated that the wearer belongs to a specific ethnic group. Headdresses, hats, head wraps, and so on often serve similar purposes, from displaying class, for example, the regal church hats of African American women, to establishing belonging, for example, the red Phrygian cap of 18th century French revolutionaries, and of course, practical functions of protection against the elements. And let's not forget the bridal veil, which has a complex history worldwide that is far too long to relate here in any detail. The veil is more than emblem, shield, or decoration, although it's those two. In order to, as it were, qualify as a veil, the scarf, the bonnet, the turban, the cloth usually must have mystique and religious or magical religious significance. Thus, even underclothes, such as Mormon temple garments, the Sudri Kushtri worn by Zoroastrians, the Talit Katan of Orthodox Jews, the sacred shirt of the Sikhs, or the red, orange, mauve robes of Buddhist monks may be considered veiling. Simply put, they are a shield between the sacred and the profane, a signal of humility and modesty before the divine. To be veiled is, to some degree, to be hidden, and right there we have a condition of both great attraction and great revulsion. There's evidence of veiling in Mesopotamia, the Iberian Peninsula, and in ancient Greece and Rome. There are veiled images of Sumerian Inanna, Babylonian Ishtar, and her Phoenician counterpart Astarte, as well as the Egyptian goddess Isis. Some claim that Purda, which is social segregation, in India is explained by the Hindu Ramayana, where Lakshmana draws a protective circle around Sita's movement during the absence of men. And harking back to the veil's origins in nature, we can imagine that these goddesses' animal guises were also veils, as might be their halos. Covering contains and protects divine knowledge in light and space. The Old Testament tells of the veiled tabernacle on Mount Sinai. There are the Torah Ark, the Veil Christian Eucharist, and Mecca's Veil Central Shrine, the Kaaba. I understand that in a Tibetan Buddhist shrine, shrine room, there are two mandalas that are always veiled, and in the Buddhist stupa, which houses relics, various ones may not be seen except by privileged practitioners with certain levels of understanding. To conceal or reveal the hair is significant among nearly all peoples. In some societies, including ours, how hair is grown, cut, or styled are spiritual and or sexual and or political equivalents of the veil. In the third century CE, long before Islam, Tertullian reported the substantial veils of Jewish women. Jewish women into the 20th century in Iraq or Tunisia or Turkey dressed and veiled much like their Muslim sisters. It was not until the 1930s that Jewish women in Iraq began dressing in the more Western styles that were already being worn by urban Muslim women. Hasidic and some Orthodox Jewish women wear wigs and tickle head scarves, which are forms of veiling sanctification beyond mere modesty, while modesty is considered women's unique and honored contribution to the world. Today, wigs are adopted by some observant Muslim Turkish women who wish to cover despite laws forbidding the veil. In some periods of ancient Greece, elite women were secluded, rarely emerging from their homes, and solidly swathed when they did. Nevertheless, slaves, artists, musicians, and tradeswomen were free to move about publicly, while highborn women were not. This has been more or less true everywhere, universally. <laughs> because it's tough to be covered when you're working in the fields or milking the goats or chasing after children or cooking or cleaning house. <clears throat> Although the desire is to be covered to display privilege. In Afghanistan, a rural farming woman in the pre-Soviet period might have wanted nothing more than to wear chadari or the burqa, which signified leisure and thus wealth. In India, 
attitudes toward Bailey and Purda fluctuate not only in accordance with the rise and fall of Muslim and, or Hindu fundamentalisms, but as indications of region, class, or caste. Before, coming, before the coming of Islam, the noble women of Mecca, like those in myriad other places, veiled or wore identifiable headgear to distinguish themselves from the rabble. The Prophet Muhammad's first wife, Khadija, a wealthy woman in her own right, wore a head covering to display her social position many years before the advent of the Quran's controversial verses of the curtain. Some scholars believe that Islam borrowed veiling from Christianity. The Greek custom of veiling women, not to say the Jewish, may be one explanation for Christian veiling. Saul of Tarsus, St. Paul, set the standard in his first letter to the Corinthians, quote, for a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. That is why woman ought to have a veil on her head. With the Second Vatican Council in 1965, the veil was lifted. Nuns were allowed to wear so-called civvies, making it easier for them to work among communities in the so-called real world. They were also permitted to live in secular housing that is outside Persia, that is no longer socially segregated. But none of this came without terrible battles and resistance from the male clergy. Ironically, even as we see conservatism rising among Muslim women who are veiling, although their mothers may not have, we are also seeing young Catholic women, young Catholic women religious choosing today to enter conservative orders where rigorous veiling is practiced. Christian customs of veiling are also honored among Protestants. Anabaptists like the Amish wear bonnets called prayer coverings. The bonnets are worn constantly because women are to pray without ceasing. Hutterite and Mennonite women also cover their heads. Moses, though not the actor Charles Custom, veiled his radiant and frightening face when speaking to the Hebrews after spending 40 days and 40 nights alone with God. Would you ponder Charlton for a minute? According to the scholars Robert Murphy and Fadwar Gindi, images of the Prophet Muhammad with a veiled face may accurately reflect veiling among Arab men. And there are, in the Hadith, the sayings of the Prophet and other writings, numerous indications that the Prophet face veiled, at least on occasion. But for all Arab men, faces were covered in certain situations, such as public celebrations, um, for reasons including modesty, as well as protection against the evil eye, especially if a man was handsome. The beard with which we associate Muslim men may also be a form of nishab. The most renowned male veilers today are probably the Tuareg, Berber-speaking people who inhabit Western and Central Sahara. The men wear their facial coverings continually. As St. Paul made clear, head covering for Christian men is not required. The monk's cowl, an emblem of the Catholic holy man, seems to be a holdover from medieval lay garments, a device to keep the head warm. Zoroastrian. Zoroastrian priests, who were always male, tie a double-layered white cotton veil across their mouths and noses to prevent saliva from defiling the sacred fire or other holy offerings. Jainism, an ascetic religion of India, emphasizes ahimsa, non-injury to all living things, and therefore monks and nuns wear muslin cloths over their mouths to avoid killing flying insects with the hot air of their breath and to prevent saliva from falling on sacred texts or revered images. None of these practices is merely about hygiene or compassion, however, but again about the nuanced and complex intersections between that which is worldly and that which is divine. Masking, used for all kinds of activities, including ritual as well as pure art theater, can also be a form of veiling. It is practiced worldwide, mostly by men. In men's secret societies, the mask hides and protects the mysteries with much the same effect as the veil, which often segregates women from men. The chadri, or burqa, with the um, uh, crocheted eye holes worn by Afghan women, and the exquisite Omani batulas, also called burgu, um, might be masks. There's, they say that um, 
the, the women, wherever the Greeks arrived, uh, loved the Greek helmets, and so they imitated them by making the gurgu um, and using those as their veils. Conversely, the colorful satin hoods, usually referred to as masks worn by Spanish male penitents called Nazareños, might be veils. While the Nazareños covered their faces in humility to God, the Ku Klux Klan, who were eerily similar face veiling, although Catholics have been among the Klan's prey of choice, use it to terrorize. Masking or veiling to exhibit power where it's otherwise lacking is often seen in conflicts of struggle against the state. Anonymity is not only critical to survival, but it also serves to evince strength. Depending on how they're used, veils and masks are tools of incorporation, for example, during weddings or fertility rites. These rites from Turkmenistan are both masked and veiled, as are traditional Hindu bridegrooms in northern India. Masks and veils are also instruments of separation, for example, during funeral rites and to shroud the dead. In certain circumstances, masks or veils become indistinguishable. Among the Tadibe Samoyed shamans wear masks, but also blindfold themselves with a kerchief in order to enter the spirit world by their own inner light. Eliade tells us that for the Samoyed shaman, it's impossible to shamanize unless the head is veiled. Back to Islam, which is far from being a monoculture, yet, as we know, there have in recent decades been a push, push toward a Muslim monolith that is articulated at least visually in women's dress and veiling practices. The standard of uh, the notion of a standard Muslim dress code is not as completely new. What were once various indigenous modes of veiling and dressing the head have been co-opted by a single mode, what some describe as originally a Saudi style, erroneously labeled as the Muslim dress code. Some abayas are extremely beautiful, and by the way, many are ironically designed in France. It's big business. But abayas are not native to, for example, Malaysia, the Philippines, Sri Lanka, or Iran, where, this is Iran, where the uh, regime sponsors fashion shows to try to persuade young women to adopt so-called authentic Muslim styles. In the West, obviously things are no better. The Muslim veil is rarely treated as a traditional or sacred custom, but is perceived almost entirely politically by non-Muslims, as well as by many Muslims. And today, the battle of the hijab has touched other displays of religious faith, Sikhs in turbans. It was a Sikh who was the first person killed by Americans after 9-11 in the gas station in California. Nobody in a turban, apparently, but safe. Jews wearing yarmulkes or Christians wearing large crosses are also outlawed in public institutions. And in Germany, authorities, just to be fair, also <coughs> ban nuns' habits along with the hijab. Since 9-11 and the 2001 invasion of Afghanistan, Afghan women have been reduced to almost nothing but their burqas. And many a Western feminist colonialist has helped maintain this image. Among other things, it boosts the sales of books inevitably titled Beyond the Veil, Behind the Veil, Lifting the Veil. But it is also cultural imperialism that has helped determine US policy in Afghanistan, distracting from the real issues faced by Afghan women and men. Human rights activist uh, Huram Parvez notes also that the veil has recently become prominent in Indian-occupied Kashmir, in the rural areas near Indian army camps, because rape and other forms of violence against women in Kashmir and worldwide have become epidemic, so the veil affords some security. What does politicizing the veil then mean in terms of women's agency? Here comes the gender studies part. The energy that's been expended on veiling issues by non-Muslims and Muslims alike is preposterous and perilous. Ultimately, today's ideological battles seem mostly to be subterfuge, distraction, hindering feminist progress, and blinding us to the increasing feminization of poverty. 
arguments about covering often merely veil the realities we must face about women's disadvantages, which feed a destructive spiral of impoverishment, population growth, and environmental degradation worldwide. 77% of the world's poor are women. 60% of the world's starving are women. Hunger is a gendered phenomenon, and yet we're busy carrying on about head flaws. The truly pressing questions about the veil are gender apartheid and the right to be fully human, safe, and healthy. The veil is a distracting and detracting banner under which insufferable conditions are permitted to continue. Where the veil and real issues concerning women intersect, that's where we have to be concerned. When women worldwide receive equal rights, veils will give way or they will stay as matters of choice. Again, it's really that simple, and I hate to be reductionist, but it does come down to this. What a woman chooses to wear on her head should be trivial to anyone other than that woman herself. And that, finally, is the truth.